بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. I have about 15 minutes to convey an important message, and if I'm successful, it's the type of message that will compel you to act with your pocketbook and to understand what to do. You will have to answer a question: What am I doing up here? To help you with that, I want to explain to you how I got here. <coughs> Yesterday, I woke up in my home that is financed. I got into my car that is also financed, drove to the train station in Washington, D.C., purchased a ticket with a credit card, and then six hours later, I was at the front counter of this hotel using a different credit card to check in. So I want to ask you to think about why I'm up here. Well, the answer to that is simple. I would like to someday, during my lifetime, be able to convey that same journey and at the end exclaim that I did all of that using Sharia compliant financial products and services. I not only want that opportunity for myself, I want that same opportunity for my children and I want that same opportunity for all Muslims living in the United States. And today it's not possible without your help and support. It is no longer the opportunity afforded to us to simply be passive about it. We must actually act. So let's talk about Islamic finance. First, we have to try and understand how it became to be labeled as Islamic finance. After all, for centuries, Muslims, Christians, and Jews all participated in financial transactions using a set of divine principles that governed those transactions. After time, modifications to those principles were introduced. Those modifications were accepted by Christians and Jews, but refrained from by Muslims. Muslims understood well that those modifications were, in essence, man's attempt to become a god on earth and therefore an encroachment on Allah's divine right. And that is why in the Quran it's condemned and that is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his prophet, peace be upon him, declare war for the only time in the Quran on riba and the participation of riba. And the promise that is made is that one day, whether you partake in riba or not, <clears throat> the mere dust of it will cover you. And that day is today. Deregulation and deception has caused the instability that we're feeling today. So let's talk about what it takes to be a good banker so we can contrast Islamic finance to conventional finance. And I am talking from experience. I was once a very good banker. And a good banker needs to apply a certain set of guiding principles to be a successful banker. The first one is called the cradle to grave theory. And actually it's very simple. Cradle is uh, a baby's cradle and grave is obviously the last time that you are on earth. And a good banker secures a portion of your income during your lifetime, from cradle to grave. And during your lifetime, he's sure that you will experience hardship. After all, who doesn't? And during those hardships are further opportunities for a good banker to profit. And of course, a good banker should offer you all of the products and services available, whether you need it or not. And he should use complex instruments that are barely understood by even bankers some of them so complex, they can simply be called, like this one, Rule of 78. Most bankers don't understand how that works. In fact, today it's outlawed. 
So let's talk about one of those modifications as it relates to our modern day life. I am sure everyone is aware of uh, the difficulties our financial sector is going through, and I want to explain to you how it got there. In 1999, a simple modification was introduced in the form of a Financial Services Modernization Act. In the picture you see, President Clinton signing that into law, surrounded by the Republican Congress that helped him pass it, and cheered on by Alan Greenspan. That year was the first time anyone uttered the words too big to fail, a word that we are very familiar with now. You see, Representative John Dingell, who did not sign this, understood that what in fact was being created were institutions that were far too big to fail. And in fact, the benefit of these modifications were really just to benefit 1% of all the society, leaving the other 99% to pay for it. After all, if it's too big to fail, who will bail them out? The diagram that you see there is the simplest way I could come up to describe a very complex process that led to where we are today. And I will try and go through it. Beginning with powerful lobbying by Wall Street and banks to Congress, Congress acted by deregulating Wall Street and banks. In turn, Wall Street loosened credit requirements, therefore weakening them and taking on excessive risk. That was passed on to the banks, who in turn loosened their credit requirements and passed on in the form of easy money to consumers to purchase homes. Consumer feeling what was called the wealth effect decided that one home wasn't enough, you should have two homes. In fact, a small home was no longer necessary, you needed to have a very big home. So consumers, in turn, began to speculate. And what happened then was a housing bubble that we now know can and will burst, and did. At the core of this was a valueless system based on profiteering, using deregulation and deception that caused the instability. That same year, ironically, guidance began its journey. And I want to introduce you to the man who started this journey for us at a time when everybody was going in a different direction. Guidance was beginning a Sharia compliant home finance company. So let me introduce you to him. Dr. Mohammed Hamour, who is founder and chairman of Guidance Residential, and I'll speak a little bit about his bios. He served as a member of the economic faculty at Columbia University and a visiting faculty at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He's a consultant to the World Bank, a research fellow at the Center for Economic Policy Research in the United Kingdom. He's published in leading scholarly journals of economics. He holds a BA in philosophy, an MS in industrial engineering from Stanford University, a PhD in economics from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Now I'd like you to hear from him yourself. of the last Prophet has given such an importance to the way we can live as individuals, as a society, as people who seek meaning in, in their life, to the way we can live in this context, in this economic realm. I think it is providential that perhaps the one profession that our Prophet has practiced is the profession of merchant. It is providential, as Sheikh Hamza mentioned, that maybe a third of the books of fiqh are about commercial transactions. It is providential that page after page of the Quran relies on economic symbolism, economic guidance in, in various realms. The essence of a lot of the pro prohibition of riba is on the exchange of money or, or commodities used as money against money, as opposed to exchanging money for 
goods or tangible realities, exchanging money for money. And any profit that is sought through such exchange is considered illegitimate, is considered riba. So it's as if when you seek to profit, to gain, you should seek to exchange what is illusory, what is only a shadow of value for what is real, tangible, higher value. But if you seek to exchange shadows for shadows and deny the need to go higher than that, isn't that the reflection of pure worldliness? Staying within the realm of illusion, staying denying a higher reality. Isn't there a connection between the practice of riba and the denial of the hereafter of higher reality? There is a tremendous amount of work and burden that we, as carrying the Islamic tradition, have to fulfill our role in this age of bringing an eternal wisdom into a realm that is uh, 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 fragmenting the society, uh, uh, leading it to, to uh, an existence of where it is building and not building, growing and collapsing feeling that uh, it is onto something uh, very powerful and the next day a panic, a crisis, leading to a complete loss of faith in the system. And then people looking for patches and regulations until enough time passes that they can forget the crisis and rebuild into another one. I think that the responsibility for us as a community in this world of, of bringing this teaching first to ourselves individually, then to uh, the entire ummah of humanity collectively is a responsibility that starts with le relearning our tradition and understanding how it can apply uh, in, in, in this modern uh, civilization. So next, guidance started by assembling the largest and best Sharia board it can find. Led by a leading and renowned Sharia board and financial transactions expert, Justice Taqi Osmani, who is chairman of AOFI and also the chairman of our Sharia board. Which led to the declining co-ownership balance structure that we utilize the diagram on the screen was published in the Wall Street Journal that demonstrates the difference between our structure and a conventional structure. Then they issued a fatwa regarding our product in three different languages, English, Arabic, and Urdu. Islamic finance principles are rooted in divine law, economic justice, circulation of wealth, commoditization, and risk sharing. This diagram demonstrates what Islamic finance looks like. An independent Sharia board where a financial institution partners with the consumer and purchases a home. It's that simple. There's no appeal to Congress. There's no modification of Islamic finance principles. And that is conventional finance versus Islamic finance. It's timeless values regulated, creating transparency, and therefore finally creating stability. So 10 years later, where are we? Guidance is the largest Sharia compliant home finance organization in the United States, representing about 80% of the market. And that is because the authenticity of our product is vetted out by consumers time and time and time again. And then of course, we received notoriety throughout the United States and worldwide 
leading these institutions to publish articles on guidance specifically time and time again. Lately, there is a lot of evidence of this taking hold throughout the world. This woman is in London in a March on Wall Street rally where she's asking the British to perhaps consider banking like Muslims. I will share this last video because it's very relevant. Last week, Spain asked the Spanish government for $19 billion to bail out the third largest Spanish bank. That $19 billion is not necessarily available to the Spanish government, and S&P just re recently downgraded the three largest Spanish banks to junk bond status, meaning it's, they, can, they cannot hold their obligations. And this might cause the entire collapse of the Spanish country. Greece is threatening to pull out of the Euro, uh, the European Union, and uh, there is quite a bit of complexity going on that's affecting the world today, and that is because of RIBA. So, using facts, this video will demonstrate what is going on in Europe with humor. Time now for John Clark and Brian Dore with a few, few reflections on Europe's financial woes. Your name is Roger, yes? Roger. Ah, that's your name? Roger. Good. And what do you do, Roger? I'm a financial consultant. Ah, financial consultant, eh? Roger, Yeah, yes. terrific. And uh, Roger, how's business at the moment? Not bad, thank you. Uh, been a bit quiet lately. H how do you mean lately? Since the war, been a bit quiet. Fair enough. Okay, Roger, your special subject tonight is the economies of the European community. Mm -hmm. Your time starts now. Best of luck. Thank you. How much does Greece owe, Roger? Uh, $367 billion. Correct. And who do they owe it to? Mostly to the other European economies. Correct. How much does Ireland owe? $865 billion. Correct. And who do they owe it to? Other European economies, mostly. Correct. How much does Spain and Italy owe? One trillion dollars each. Correct. Who to? Mainly France, Britain and Germany. Correct. And how are Germany, France and Britain going, Roger? Well, they're struggling a bit, aren't they? Correct. Why? Well, because they've lent all these vast amounts of money to other European economies that can't possibly pay them back. Correct. So what are they going to do? They're going to have to bail them out. Correct. Where are they getting the money to do that, Roger? That's a good question. I don't know the answer to that one. How much does Portugal owe? Hang on a minute. What was the answer to that earlier question? Just keep answering the questions, Roger. Where is Portugal going to get the money it owes to Germany if Germany can't get back the money that it lent to Italy? Just a minute. What was the answer to the previous question? The question was, how can broke economies yes. lend money to other broke economies yes. who haven't got any money because they can't pay back the money the broke economy lent to the other broke economy and shouldn't have lent it to them in the first place because the broke economy can't pay it back? You're wasting very valuable time, Roger. How much money does Spain owe to Italy? $41 billion, but where are they going to get it? Correct. What does Italy owe to Spain? $27 billion, but they haven't got it. They're broke. Correct. How can they pay each other if neither of them has any money? They're going to get a bailout, aren't they? Correct. And where's the money coming from for the bailout? That's what I'm asking you. Correct. Why are people selling the European currency and buying the US dollar? Because the US economy is so much stronger than the European economy. Correct. Why is that, Roger? Because it's owned by China. Correct. And uh, very well done. And after that round, you've lost a million dollars. I've lost a million dollars. I thought you said well done. Yes, well done. You've only lost a million dollars. That's an extraordinary performance, I've Roger. I've only lost a million dollars. Very well done. And that's quite good, is it? Oh, it's excellent. Sell everything immediately. Quickly. And I'll close by saying that this quote was used by John Adams, the second president of the United States. There are only two ways to conquer a nation and enslave it. One is by sword and the other is by debt. I'd like to thank you very much for your time and I'd like you to think about why I was up here in the first place. Please think about that and I appreciate your time and your indulgence. Thank you very much.